You are listening to Fast Track Podcast, the place to be to fast track your personal finance or fast track your business or both through a series of conversations with those who have learned it, done it, and made it. As the CEO of Turtle Tree, Feng Ru leads the overall Turtle Tree Labs team. What started as a passion to make cheese turned into a hunt for good quality milk in Asia. When her sourcing attempts failed, she was prompted to dive into the idea of creating milk herself. With this, she boldly founded Turtle Tree Labs to make milk through cell-based methods. She has previously worked in corporate sales at Google and Salesforce. And in this episode, we will learn about what is lab grown milk and how a corporate sales professional turned into one of the most promising tech startup CEO. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the Fast Track Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. And I know that you have a career background, always being in corporate sales, so at Salesforce and Google. How did you end up starting and running a milk tech company? It's kind of random, but I want to hear the story. <laughs> sure. So I've always worked for tech companies, always love cutting edge technology. But another side of me is I like to make cheese. So a few years ago, I started on a big cheese journey. I even went up to Vermont, uh, which is upstate New York, to learn how to make cheese. So I know what good milk looks like. I know what good cheese, how should it perform? So when I came back to Singapore, I wanted to replicate um, those processes. So in order to make good cheese, I needed to have good access of raw milk. So I went, went around the region. I was in Indonesia. I was in Thailand, trying to look for different sources of milk. But soon I was exposed to things like contract farming, to antibiotics and, and hormones that are being pumped into the cows. As a result, the milk quality is always um, suffering. It's not as good. So I gave up that whole cheese hobby. And back then I was still working for Google. And that was when I met my co-founder, Max. He was the CEO of a different tech company back then. And he was at Google. He was in my office sharing about different technologies like Memphis Meat, Blue Nalu. These are um, cell-based meat companies using cells to make meat and seafood. So after the talk, I went to him and asked him if there are similar methods to make milk. Back then, there were no other companies doing it. So we started to do a lot of research around this area. We pulled in some scientist friends. And last year, we managed to make some breakthroughs. We filed our patents. And this year, we're just scaling the company. And so your company is called Turtle Tree. Why is this name? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So turtles and trees are symbols of longevity. And we believe in the longevity of the animals and the earth. And if you look at our logo, it looks like the cross section of a tree, or it looks like a thumbprint. So it symbolizes man's print on nature. And in similar fashion, we are working on innovations to extract the best nutrition from nature. Mm, that's a very nice name. And I, I like it because it sounds very cute and then people can remember it. And then when you, when you think about lab grown milk and then it's called turtle tree, there is kind of like connection. It's all about nature, animals. Yeah, that's right. And we, we really want people to be able to recognize um, the logo, recognize the brand and associate it with how, how milk can be sourced in different methods. Um, about sustainability, about circular economy. So we really want to be able to connect um, with these values that, that we want to bring across. And tell the audience about Turtle Tree. Do you produce milk from your lab and then sell it directly to supermarket or do you sell the technology or exactly what is your business model? So we, we are able to create milk using cells and this method of creating milk, we don't plan to go to market with our own turtle tree products. We want to be able to work with the major dairy processes, the major dairy brands, ranging from Danon, Nestle, Abbott to Fonterra, to partner up with them to allow them an alternative source of milk rather than working with farms or as an alternative to farms. Uh, we want to be um, a technology that these companies can tap on to be able to feed the next billion people coming onto this planet. And do you see there's a trending demand for lab-grown 
products. For example, like in the US, Beyond Meat has gone crazy in the market. And what do you think about the future of lab produced products? Sure. So let me let me highlight a little bit of how this whole industry is uh, with regards to the different players. So we have these um, folks like Beyond Meat and Impossible. These are really plant-based meat products where they take extracts of plants, press into a patty, and really the whole thing is plant-based, but it tastes exactly like beef. Uh, for the cell-based meat industry, we're talking more about companies like Memphis Meats and Blue Nalu and most and Ella Farms. So these companies are getting cells from cows or from seafood itself, multiplying these cells to a large number, pressing these into a patty and eating it. So it would have a nutritional content just like beef because it's using actual beef cells, just not grown from the beef, the cow body, but instead in a bioreactor. So there's a little bit of a of difference. Currently, the trend is let's focus directly on, on milk itself. We do see a lot of plant-based milk products gaining a lot of traction on the field. We've got almond milk, we've got oatly, and these milks are, are great because it helps to replace bovine milk for drinking milk. So you can have oatly with your coffee, you can have oatly for breakfast. But when it comes to making high value dairy products like cheese, butter, yogurt, you would need the entire composition of milk and not plant-based milk. Plant-based cheese, butter, and yogurt usually don't taste or perform exactly like bovine cheeses. So you really need the entire composition directly, which is very similar to, to what comes out of a cow which is why we adopt our method, which is cell-based. Generally, what we're doing is we are creating the factory that creates the milk using um, the same cells that creates milk from inside the mammal, just taking it out and growing it to a large number in, in a, in a bioreactor environment outside of the mammal. So there is a trend of, of interest in the VC world for cell-based milk and cell-based meat, just because nutritionally, it's a lot more closer to real meat than if it's plant-based. At the same time, all of the cell-based meat companies are still either in manufacturing skill or in R&D. There is there's still a, a bit of a, this, a while before the first products go to market. But people like Memphis Meats uh, who are leading the way for, for this entire industry, they, they are claiming that even as early as next year, they would have a product to market. Right. Yeah. And also, as you mentioned, Oli, I watched a documentary about how Oli went crazy in the recent years. And mm -hmm. there is a consistency in its liquid. That's why people like it, especially from the for the coffee shops. But what you mentioned, the, the complete composition of the milk that is needed to produce cheese and milk based product, it's some other replacement cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. And what, what are the biggest challenges in your turtle tree journey so far? So I think some of the earlier challenges that we had was that my co-founder and I, Max and I, we are not necessary scientists. So we do have a lot of, a lot of investors or, or people from the industry coming to us and ask us, you're not scientists, what business do you have running a science company? And I think after almost two years now, it is precisely because we're not scientists, we are able to have a wider range of understanding of different technologies, and we are able to pull them into our business to help accelerate some of the um, R&D that we've been doing. So we're not married or attached to a single technology. Instead, we are very business focused. We are end result driven. So we would use whatever means necessary, whatever technology necessary to be able to help the company grow. Yeah, I think you turned this disadvantage into advantage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we it's it's about making use of what we have and what we know. And because we're not scientists, so our scientist friends are actually really open to to share with us about the different technologies that they're working on to to help us give us ideas and brainstorm. So it, now even now we have um some investors like Green Monday. Oh, who've expressed a lot of confidence um, in our leadership. And at the beginning, do you already, when you work with your co uh, partner, like co-founder Max, do you already have sort of prototype or MVP of this technology or you worked it together and develop it later on? 
yeah, we, we had to, I mean, initially we had to bring in some scientists um, who've had previous experience that was relevant to what we're doing. But everything, all the IP that the team has built has uh, been built with during their, their employment in Turtle Tree. So we, we were the ones who developed a lot of the IP that uh, we found. And did you self-found at the beginning or did you already have some investors right at the beginning? Yeah, I mean, from the start, we knew that we had to put in some of our own money to reach a certain point before it makes sense to bring in money from investors. So right from the start, Max and I put in half a million dollars of our own money to, to bring that company, to bring our company to that certain point. What kind of confidence that did you have to put so much money in the company at the beginning? What, what makes you to make that decision? For me, it's about the timing and also the opportunity to, to make a difference. We, we are at a point in time where biotech business and consumer acceptance has reached a convergence point where the technology is allowing us to do a lot of special things through biologics, through cell engineering, through even big data to make decisions a lot faster to optimize our whole process. At the same time, with the success of Impossible and Beyond, people are getting more and more aware of what they're consuming. They are making a conscious decision to to consume things that would not harm the environment, especially for the younger generation. They are the ones who are going to make a change, who want to make a change, because they've seen how terrible the, the environment is, sustainability challenges, and the consumer is pushing us to come up with more and more new technologies to help alleviate those problems. Yeah, and as you mentioned, this is like you call this as alternative protein industry, right? What do you think, how would the industry be in the next few years? Sure. So I think the industry will be accelerating accelerating towards alternatives. It could be alternative proteins. It could be alternative nutrition. So some of the interesting things that we observe infant nutrition companies or specialized nutrition companies adopting is ingredients that are not just good for calories, but ingredients that are actually good for functional development, things like brain growth, gut development. And these things can be sourced through certain special molecules that can be found in stuff like human milk. So complex sugars, bioactive proteins, these can be found um, in human milk and have been known to, to help accelerate some of the development for babies, geriatric care, and lots of different applications. And our partners are very interested in exploring these areas. And recent years, I've been so many, see so many different alternative foods. Let's say, for example, right now I'm using Hue. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's like a UK based company. They produce like powders, but then you just need to put water and shake it and then you replace meal. <laughs> but this is, this is for people. I think it's good that people do not have a lot of time nowadays. They're always in a rush and then you still get all the nutritions. And as you mentioned, Beyond Meat, Impossible, like so many options nowadays. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are a lot of options now. And I think one thing I want to highlight is these options are great. But if you're talking about the $700 billion dairy industry, most of it is propped up um, by the high value byproducts like cheese, butter and yogurt. And, and it will be difficult to, to replace dairy for those um, high-value products. And we still need to be able to use technology to continue providing people what they're used to. And do you have any competitors in the market right now? Yes. So interestingly, just last week, there's new Israeli company that came out doing quite similar things. And before that, earlier in the year, we have another company based out of North Carolina that also came out. We do expect more competitors to come out onto the field with cell-based milk, but we, we are very confident that we are ahead of the, of the game. We do have a lot of collaborations. We have accelerated our progress over the past two years. And we, it's good. It's good to create a sector. So, so far we've created a, a category and we, we believe we need more folks on the market to be able to support the food that people need to consume. Yeah, and also grow the category together. And is there any difference that you see in demand? Lab-grown milk from Europe to North America or Asia, do you see any differences? 
in demand? So I think the I would say less talk about less about the demand, but more about the regulations. Just because as the regulations would determine what kind of products can be released in the market. So when it comes to cell-based food products, Asia is actually pretty advanced and pretty open. We're working very closely with the Singapore Food Agency to update them about our process, our progress. And once we, we do have a product ready, we do expect Singapore to be very supportive in that area. And with regards to North America as well, in the US, we, we've heard that cell-based meat companies are making a lot of progress with the FDA. With regards to Europe, they, they are a little bit more conservative, but we, we do expect Singapore and the US to, to be the first, the first markets to, to launch. Yeah. And also, I think I read um, a news or watched a documentary before, even in Dubai, in the region there, it's very difficult to raise cows and to produce a lot of milk. <laughs> I'm sure there could be a lot of usage there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I want to touch on about your entrepreneurial journey a little bit. So yeah. since you started beginning of your company till now, like how, how long is it? It's been a, a, almost two years now. Okay, that's pretty fast. And then how did you manage to progress so fast by developing the technology, securing funding? What do you think that you do or you have done correctly to help you progress so fast? So I think for me, coming from SMU, we, we are taught to be, to be business leaders and to be able to activate the right resources to help support our growth. So one thing that we did very early on is set up the right systems and processes to onboard new scientists, new team members at, at a fast speed. So we've set up a CRM system, we've set up um, a system called Benchling, which is an online cloud system that allows all the scientists to upload their experiments as well as their results onto a single platform. So as, as we grow our science team, as we start collaborating with different collaborators, say with universities in Netherlands, universities in the US, we, we have a single view of where everyone is at and we're able to project manage the whole thing a lot more seamlessly. On top of that, the usual project management tools. And another thing is we once, what Max and I do quite well is we recognize that um, as founders of the company, we need to be able to internalize certain tasks pretty well. But once we do something really well, either finance, pitch decks, planning, strategy planning, once we do something pretty well, we will get our teammates to, to, to take on these tasks so that we can continue to grow the company and think about how to strategize for the next step. So I think being able to pass on the knowledge and coach our team is something that we've done pretty well. And of course, bringing on the right talent, it's so important. We have an amazing team across six different smaller teams and all of them are working in parallel to meet certain milestones that, that we've planned out. And how many people are working in Turtle Tree now? Currently we have about 20, 20 full time. Okay. And uh, you have raised a lot of funding, right? Recently. <laughs> we, we have raised, we just closed out our seed round of 3.2 million. That was uh, maybe three or four months ago. So that was led by Green Monday Ventures. We also have CPT Capital, as well as KBW, which is the fund of Prince Khalid from Saudi Arabia. We have Artisan, which is the pension fund of Australia. And uh, we, we do have a lot of prolific angel investors as well. So we've been really lucky. But on top of that, we've been really fortunate to win the Tomasic Livability Challenge. That happened earlier this year. It was a million dollars of undiluted funding. And also more, more recently, we just won the Entrepreneurship World Cup. That was half a million dollars of undiluted funding as well. So all in all, the team is pretty well funded at the moment. And we're using these funds to continuously accelerate our progress. And what is your plan for the next step? So next step would be Series A, and uh, we expect that to happen sometime half of next year. And that is when we'll raise funds for our large-scale manufacturing 
and we, we should expect certain um, deals to be signed by then, just so that we have a good gauge of the manufacturing capabilities that we need to set up. Mm-hmm. Talking about funding, I think it's one of the most difficult things for all the entrepreneurs. What did you think that you did it very well to secure funding from so many different parties and and your investors? I think it's two main things. I mean, coming from my tech background, for me, is always filling the top of the funnel. So we, we speak to every single investor, no matter how big or how small they are, with the same amount of passion. And that allows us to understand um, the landscape of investors, get connected to different investors. And and that's building a good brand for ourselves. The second thing would be good storytelling. So as an early stage investor, they would want to invest in founders. I never quite understood how that meant until about a year, year and a half in. Then we recognized that with every startup, there there are decisions to be made every single day. And it is really up to the founders to to think about how they can activate the right resources, which areas they should focus on, which talent they should bring in. And these early decisions would determine um, the success of the company, especially for the early stages. So it's it's about telling the right story and being able to, to share your vision with the investors. And investing in the founders, what do you think are the key characteristics or traits of a founder that angel investors are looking for? I would think it's definitely great being able to push through difficult situations, being able to think outside the box is really important as well. And being able to convince, delegate, all these are very important points. Yeah, thank you. You just described your your personal trait (laughs) as far as I know you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> thank you no it's uh i learn I'm, I le- I'm learning a lot along the way mm-hmm. as well yeah um co-founder of my team so these are things that um i've picked up to be very important when running the business how do you think your experiences in salesforce and google contributed to your current entrepreneur journey oh it's a it's a huge impact if i just touch on say google um in google we're all about 10x impact. For every effort that we put in, we want to think about how it can have a ripple effect 10x. So whenever we we execute on a decision here at Turtle Tree, we're always thinking about whether or not it's big enough, whether or not it's making a big enough impact. So I can give you an example. When we first came up with this idea to make milk using cells, we were thinking, okay, what is the best way to go to market? Will it be coming up with a turtle tree can of milk or will it be to partner up with industry? So we started to to look at a lot of business models around the world. And one business model that caught my eye was actually ARM Semiconductors. There is an SMU researcher who collaborated with HBR to, to write a business case about ARM Semiconductors so Lipika, we met her last year and we learned a lot from her. So what ARM did was they, they started off with seven founders, small company, uh, but they wanted to make a big impact. So they're the largest chip company in the world now that doesn't make a single chip. What they do is they work with Samsung, they work with Apple to build out the architecture of the chip for all these different companies. But Apple or Samsung, they'll they'll manufacture their own chip or they'll get their own contract manufacturers. This way, ARM allows themselves to be capital light. They don't have to spend too much on CapEx and work on the licensing and royalty model and work with every partner in the industry. So at the end of the day, they see themselves as being the R&D hub of the entire industry. So this allows them larger access to different markets, different product types, different product lines. So for us, we, we, we aim to be the same way. We want to be able to work with different partners, through them, go through to, to work to the different geographical locations and the different product lines and the different industry focus. And this allows us to have a larger impact across the dairy industry. Yeah, it's a very brilliant business model. <laughs> yeah. yeah, learn a lot from SMU. <laughs> <laughs> for the audience. 
SMU is Singapore Management University, so yeah. where we study together. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my last question is, where can people try the products? So that would be sometime、um, in the horizon.、Mm -hmm. So let me share about what the team is currently doing. So we are in close collaboration with four of the five largest infant nutrition companies to think about which are the best、um, products to come up with in collaboration. So after the、uh, product is somewhat defined, we will sign a contract for a multi-year deal, and then following that. We will set up the manufacturing prog process for the kind of skill that these partners would need. So, some of the ingredients that we've spoken to these partners about, they will need a minimum of twenty tons a year of. So, to to get to that skill, we will need quite a horizon before we can get there. So, it, it would be a few years before you would see a turtle tree inside product in the market. But we we plan we do plan to sign our first commercial deals as early as next year. Yeah. So the audience should follow social media on the website、yeah. to follow up if they're interested to have a taste in the future. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I'm very active on LinkedIn. If there are new entrepreneurs or friends who want to just have a chat or bounce off ideas, I'm very open to that. We are also very active on Twitter. You can check out our website、um, at turtletreelabs dot com. Yeah. And, okay.、Uh, I will put all the links in the show notes so people can find you and your、sweet. website. Okay.、Sweet. Thanks, Asu. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fast Track Podcast. Show me your support by liking this episode and sharing it with a friend. Join the Facebook group at Fast Track Podcast One. Or you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and of course the homepage FastTrack.Live. See you in the next episode.